Okay, we're going to go uh, continue down Hancock. It's this uh, stone marker in front of this property. It says South Wark Soup Kitchen, which was started way back in 1805. This building isn't that old. But I wanted to stop here because uh, in a few minutes we are going to talk about the waves of immigration that transformed this area beginning in the 19th century. But you know, when most immigrants arrived in America, they not only didn't know anybody, they of course in many cases didn't know the language, strange land, strange language. They had no friends, no contacts. This soup kitchen was run by charitable organizations. There were dozens of them throughout the city of Philadelphia where at the very least you could stop in, somebody would greet you, welcome you to America, give you a cup of soup and a piece of bread. That was it. That was the extent of the social services back in the 19th century. <laughs> Folks, come on up just a little bit farther. Uh, I want you to be able to see Shot Tower. I know it's a very prominent landmark, certainly the high point in this part of the city. Does anybody know what a shot tower is or what it's used for? Any guesses? I don't want to put... Yeah, ammunition, right. Shot, exactly. And the, way, uh, the reason why the tower is so high is they would take uh, molten lead and then drop it from the top and then gravity, centrifugal force, would create a round pellet, right? Then it would drop into a big vat of water and cool off. So this is the oldest surviving, I think, shot tower in the country. It dates back to 1812. And they built it just in time because the War of 1812 had just started. So this provided munitions not only for that war, but for the Civil War. So it was a prominent, prominent landmark that survives. One of the last. Yes? Samples of the shot from there. Oh. The Jeanette said at old uh, Gloria Day, they have samples of the original shot. And where do you have it? In your collection? It's on display. It's on display. So that's a pretty cool thing. Thank you. And this is where Commissioner's Hall was. Remember I said on the map there's that big building? So imagine big brick edifice, three stories with a cupola. Very impressive building. Unfortunately torn down, I think maybe in the 1920s. I'm not quite sure. Uh, replaced by this strip mall. Uh, but it served as the political center for Southwark for many, many years. When it was incorporated into the city, it became the uh, second district police office or headquarters. So imagine that being here. And the 100 block of Beck Street, all of which is historically designated, the entire block, is a very early example of full block row house development, which became common throughout the city of Philadelphia. Prior to the 1840s, which is when these houses were built, mostly builders did spec housing. They did three or four houses. They really didn't do blocks. So this really changed the landscape of Philadelphia, which is now everywhere, you know, particularly in this part of the city. All right, we're going to get out of the rain, the off and on rain, and we're going to go into Philip Neri and sit down. I selected this as a key stop on the on the tour for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, one of the handouts I gave you showed a riot taking place in front of this building uh, back in the 1840s. And we were just talking about the 1840s when we were at Beck Park. So we've left, obviously, the 18th century. We're now in the middle part of the 19th century. And I want to take a few minutes and just talk about this because, again, it's a lesser known chapter of Philadelphia history, but very important because this marks uh, a sea change in the way the city develops from this point on. So what do I mean by that? Well, up until the 1840s, the population of the city of Philadelphia was mostly comprised of Protestants who were either from uh, Germany, of German descent, or English, primarily, for a long, long time. Of course, we had the Swedes, who were part of the early settlement, but the dominant group was that group. All of a the sudden, there's a flood of new immigrants coming in, beginning in the 1830s, really accelerating in the 1840s, almost all Irish Catholic. So what do you think happens when you mix suddenly two very different groups of people? Well, there's obviously going to be tension. Now, one of the uh, traditions which uh, is common throughout the city of Philadelphia when a neighborhoods became established with ethnic groups is they would build their own churches. 
So this is certainly one that was built to uh, service the new Irish American community in Southwark. So why were there riots outside? Well, there was growing sediment throughout the city, really alarm that too many people were coming in from places like Ireland. They were taking our jobs. Tell me if this sounds familiar. <laughs> they were taking our jobs. They were undercutting our pay. We don't want them here. They were called the nativist party. Well, they took action to the street. The politicians wouldn't listen. And being the United States of America, of course, we welcome immigrant groups. Uh, the result of that, of course, were riots throughout the city of Philadelphia. Many, uh, several churches were either damaged or burned to the ground. This one came very close to it. What started the riot down here was a rumor that arms were being stockpiled by the Catholics in this church. And of course, there was some truth to that because they had to protect their property. They knew that in other parts of the city, uh, these groups, large groups of Protestants had broken into the churches and burnt them. So this was a brand new building. They weren't going to let that happen here. The other thing that sparked all of this trouble was the Irish Catholics who were coming into the city uh, had to attend, they only had one option really, public schools. Uh, they didn't have parochial schools then. This was a new group coming into the city. And in the public schools, uh, they wanted to read their version of the Bible, the Catholic version of the Bible, the only one that was available, and they used to have school prayer until the 1950s, was the St. James Version, which outraged parents of these Irish Catholic kids. We don't want them reading that Bible. Uh, so that's another reason why you know, this tension developed and grew and resulted in riots. The riots that took place out here in July of, uh, let me see, I think it was 1844, if I'm not mistaken, uh, lasted three days. If you can imagine federal militia here and state militia here called in by the governor and the federal government to, to restore order, cannons being lined up along 2nd Street, some of which were firing into the crowd to disperse them. Ugly scene. Uh, hundreds of people were killed not only here, but throughout the city, several hundred more injured. One of the outcomes of this battle is the establishment, really, of the parochial school system for some of the reasons that I just gave you. In fact, I think either one of the first or the first parochial school classroom was in the basement of this building. So that's an important chapter in history. The other reason why I wanted to mention that is that with this influx of immigrants coming in and all this tension that I just talked to you about. The other result of this is that the population of the city is dramatically increasing. And while we're used to social services today, like I said before, there really weren't any in the 19th century. So the population, the local population, sees all of this change taking place. They keep begging the mayor and the city fathers to do something about it. They don't do anything about it. They don't have any resources to do anything about it. So what's happening is that the city is changing and growing at double the visitation, excuse me, double the number of residents in the city every 10 years during this period. Can you imagine that? Now the city, I believe, by the early 19th century probably had 80, maybe 70 or 80,000 people. So in a 10 year period, it doubles. And there's no safety net for any of these new people coming in. They just cram them in wherever they can go. So of course, the result of that's going to be strife, riots, anguish. Some things never change, though. And the whole idea of cities growing at such a great speed and trouble ensuing is uh, something that we're still experiencing in America, except it's not in places like Philadelphia. It's in places like Las Vegas or in the Southwest which have, in recent time, experienced the same sorts of things. Now, they don't have riots breaking out in the street, but, you know, it's an impossible thing to manage. This is where the connection is. Poe lives in the city of Philadelphia during all of this chaos. And the brochure I put in there is uh, Philadelphia Through Poe's Eyes. 
So he doesn't live in this neighborhood. He actually lived up at 7th and Spring Garden, which is now a historic site. You can visit it as a public museum. But um, I also mention it because writers are influenced by their surroundings and what's happening socially. So many of Poe's stories are derived in part from his experiences here, both good and bad. Uh, after the American Civil War, we have an influx in much greater numbers. All right, I already said the city was doubling in size, so can you imagine accelerates after the Civil War and continues almost for 50 years until Congress stops immigration or limits it. And that happened in the 1920s. But in between like 1870 and 1920, Eastern Europeans flood the country and cities like Philadelphia. So uh, people of Polish descent, both Jewish and Catholic, populate this area. And 4th Street's a good example of the, the Jewish population center. Italians come here in great numbers and create, of course, the Italian market. But one of the interesting things is that they're, they don't mix. You know, they divide off street by street, pretty much in cluster. African Americans have really never been a part of this part of the city, historically, until the 1960s, when they built the public housing project, which still segregates. It's an issue that Queen Village still deals with. Um, the situation's better than it was before, but, but there's four blocks off Washington Avenue between, I think it's, what's it called, the South Work Project? Or, yeah, where uh, it's probably almost 100% African American and the opposite is true of the neighborhood around it. So there's certainly no mix there. Historically, African Americans were on either side of Lombard Street throughout the 19th century, uh, Mother Bethel Church, historic landmark, uh, going west. And remnants of the historic black community which spread out throughout the city are still uh, prominent on the west side of Broad Street, right around Catherine. In other words, if you continue due west, you'll find there's still a pretty strong historic black community there. Um, okay. For many years, the immigration depot station was at the foot of Washington Avenue. So right next to where we started this tour, uh, hundreds of thousands of immigrants came through there. That depot was actually not created for immigrants. It wasn't built for that purpose. It was built for uh, soldiers going to war during the Civil War. Tens of thousands of soldiers heading to battlefields in the south came in through that entry point. And then, as I said, after the Civil War, when immigration really picks up steam, uh, that's converted into an immigration station. Ellis Island is bigger, uh, more volume, but quite a few immigrants, hundreds of thousands, came in through Washington. And Washington Avenue used to have uh, train tracks. They would actually come through processing. The majority of people who came in through that point went west. They didn't stay in the city of Philadelphia. Some did, of course, but most went to the coal countries up around Scranton, Wilkesboro, and also Pittsburgh. Does the Historical Society hold those records? Yes. Yeah, the Historical Society has a treasure trove of images and records. Uh, it's a pretty amazing place. I just wanted to point out that there was, we just left the church and there was a church on this property before uh, this park was created. It was called Trinity Episcopal. Uh, do you know when it was torn down, Jeanette? Uh, was it 20th century? Or? 1909, 19... Okay, early, early 20th century. And the other reason why I wanted to mention that is when churches moved or were demolished, they also had to remove the cemeteries. So they'd have contractors come in and dig up probably hundreds of bodies and then relocate them. Quite a grim task, but something that happened commonly throughout the city.